its modus operandi, his method of operations. It's a military intelligence term to understand what your enemy is up to. In fact, to know your enemy. So to know what Satan is up to now and in the time to come, we need to go back and look to see how he behaved in time past. And there's particular junctions at the time of Genesis 6 is one, another, when the Israelites came into the promised land, and furthermore on a third occasion when Jesus Christ came onto the scene as the promised Messiah. So those particular three junctions are interesting for us to understand what happened there. Satan's modus operandi then for us to know how he will be in time to come. There's a scripture from Ecclesiastes chapter 1 9 where it says that there's nothing new underneath the sun. The thing which has been is that which shall be and the thing which has been done is that which shall be done and there is nothing new underneath the sun. So I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So speed up from the Garden of Eden when Satan came down and he looked upon man it was the first time that you had this person that could go directly to God without being channeled via him. He was formerly Lucifer, the anointed cherub which covers and all worship had to come through him, filtered by him to God who is a consuming fire according to Hebrews 12:29. But man, who was created in the image and likeness of God, was the first being that could go directly to God without going via Lucifer. Just like today, 1 Timothy tells us in chapter 2, 5, that there's one mediator between God and man, that man, Jesus Christ. So, we live in a privileged time. Furthermore, you've got to understand that that was man in the natural sense coming to God, the Father, but more importantly, when the body of Christ was formed, it was the first time when man actually went into the heavens, so to speak. Prior to that time, man, righteous man, would go to the place of righteous, which was also called Sheol in the Hebrew, or Abraham's bosom later in Luke chapter 16. Paradise, and he would go there. But when the body of Christ was formed and man passed, then he went into the presence of God. The Jews would go to Abraham's bosom and the Christians, if they saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, then they go into what is called the Lord's bosom. And this is the first time that he's witnessed that Christians were going into the presence of God in heaven. Remember when Abel died, his blood cried out from the earth. Jesus Christ spoke about the heart of the earth, sure, where this place of righteousness was, this place of paradise, which was later caught up into the third heaven, which John on the Isle of Patmos witnessed. Paul accounts for this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. That's John, not Paul. Paul just does the account. I knew a man that was caught up to the third heaven. That man was John. And so it's very important to understand that he has it in for the Christians because they are able to go to the Father without going through Him. And He even says in Isaiah chapter 14, 13, that He's going to make His throne above the stars of God. Now, who are the stars of God? Well, Job 38, 7 tells us when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy, the stars of God are the angels of God, and He says He's going to make His throne above the angels of God. But we know as Christians that we get caught up into heavenly places and we are going to be above the angels in the heavens so we are going to be above the stars so the very place that he covets and he wants to go and be and be worshipped in is the place that we're going to be co-heirs with Christ so there's essentially when he's cast out of heaven in Revelation 12 9 to earth then we inhabit those places which Colossians 1.16 speaks about, the thrones, dominions, principalities and powers. We inhabit those places where he has been kicked out of him and his cohorts, his devils. Colossians 2.15 reminds us that Jesus Christ, he spoiled devils and principalities and powers. 
made a show of them openly and triumphing over them. So he triumphed over the devils, principalities and powers. The word demon is not used in the King James Bibles, substituted that in the modern versions. The original word is the word devils. They use the word devils. That's why James 2.19 says, Thou believest, thou doest well, even the devils believe and tremble. So it's not good enough just to believe. Many people go and they believe. But you need to confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him up from the dead. And anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For with the mouth we confess unto salvation and with the heart we believe unto righteousness. That's what Romans 10, 9-13 essentially tells us. So when we look at the first junction in Genesis 6, now remember already in Genesis 3 that Satan beguiled Eve and essentially when Adam sinned, Satan usurped his dominion and that dominion was only taken later in Jesus Christ on the cross. Hence the verse Colossians 2.15, he spoiled the devil's powers and the principalities. He spoiled them. In fact, 1 Corinthians 2.8 tells us that had the, prince, had the princes of darkness known, they would not have crucified the, the, the God of glory. They would not have crucified Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.8, had they known about the power of the cross and that it would bring you and me into the presence of God without going through this angelic cohort. So we have Genesis 6 very instrumental. So let me Draw a timeline here for you so you can understand. And let me put the cross in the middle. So you have Genesis 6 here. And Genesis 6 was a time when the sons of God had intercourse with the daughters of man. They came down and they looked upon the daughters of man and they saw that they were beautiful and they had intercourse with them. And they produced what is known as the Nephilim which was a giant species. It was a hybrid spiritual species. More than in a moment. And these giants were called Nephilim, and they're actually called by six different names by the time you get to the book of Numbers. They're also called the Anakim, from Anak, giants. And it's important for you to understand in Genesis 6 verse 3, the time span during the days of Noah was reduced to 120 years. So after the flood, the time, the length of man's days was reduced to 120 years. Genesis 3, 6, 3. And then in the next verse, Genesis 6, 4, it tells us that there were giants in those days and also after that. So we're going to first focus on the giants in those days. Then we're going to focus on those and also after that. So during this time, Satan sent his demonic forces upon earth and they impregnated the human species to the point that only Noah, his wife, his three sons and three daughters were untouched. They were uncontaminated by this angelic force that impregnated the daughters of man. Hence, that God did not send Jesus Christ the Savior then. He sent Him later. He did not save Him then because this bunch was an unredeemable race. They had their DNA changed. They were giants. They were Nephilim. They were half human, half angelic. They were a fallen race. And they were unredeemable. The angels cannot be redeemed. Once they've sinned, that's why you pick up in Jude verse 6, it tells us that the angels that left their first estate at this time have been reserved in darkness until their judgment. 2 Peter 2.4 echoes Jude 6 and 2 Peter 2.4 tells us that in this place of, which is called Tartarus in the Greek, and they're going to be judged by God, they're in this holding place. For what they did here, they left their first estate. They're no longer angelic. They came into this, they took on the bodies 
It's very important for you to understand when you get to the Gadarean demonic on this side, they're taking the bodies of the pigs, of the swine. You can understand here, they're a spirit. They only take a body. Territorial spirits. So here we have the first modus operandi of Satan and that he sends his angels, his angels, to take uh, wives from men and to impregnate them and then to create this human super race that is unredeemable, that needs to be destroyed, be wiped out. And all the giants at here at this time are wiped out. However, later on, after Egypt, when they travel through the wilderness and Moses sends the 12 spies into the promised land and they go for 40 days and they come back and 10 have an evil report and 2 have a good report, Caleb and Joshua. But the 10 say that we are grasshoppers in their sight and they speak about these giants in the land of Canaan. So here we have another junction and in the land of Canaan. So we don't hear about giants again from Noah in the new world. We know Genesis 8 lands in the new world. Right up through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you don't hear about giants. Right into Egypt, you don't hear about giants. Israel going to Egypt according to the prophecy that God gave Abraham for a period of 400 years. Only when they exit do they come into contact, the spies, and they look and they see the giants. And that giants are only around the land of Canaan. They were not widespread. Only in the land of Canaan. They go under about six different names. We know Goliath was one of the famous giants. He was a Philistine. But during this period of time, right up until the days of David, David essentially wipes out this giant super race that was in the land of Canaan. So Genesis 6 was the first time and Satan plays the same game, the same modus operandi and he brings the Nephilim again. There were giants in those days, Genesis 6 verse 4 and also after that, during this period of time in the promised, promised land. Satan is only interested in the promised land. So he wasn't spreading his giants in Egypt and other parts. They were only focusing on the promised land because he knew according to the prophecy given to Abraham by God himself that the Jews were going to come back to Canaan. They were going to come back into the promised land. So he was beginning to work in the promised land and make it inhabitable and inhospitable for the Israelites. And that he's Men, these men of renown, the giants, the Kim, the Nephilim, would be able to conquer essentially Joshua and his army. And how they received these demons is through their occultic and satanic and seances and their worshipping of um, Satan. And they would go through their satanic seances to be inhabited by these spirits. That's why you've got the Syrophoenician woman. She's Syrophoenician. She's from Syria. And she's from Phoenicia, which is a port in Syria. And her daughter is vexed with a devil. And she comes to the Lord in Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 15. And she calls on the Lord. He calls him the son of David because her daughter is vexed with a devil. So you see at the time of Jesus Christ, just prior to the cross, there's Israelites and the Syrophoenician woman whose people are under the spell of Satan. But get into there in a moment. So you've got the modus operandi essentially was inhabit the children of God, inhabit the, 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 the people the persons, inhabit them, inhabit Israel's enemies. So you could raise up an enemy against Israel. So this bonus operandi was the same. In Genesis 6, and when the Jews came into the promised land, same bonus operandi, same thing that he did. 
So hence we're going to see something similar here, where after the cross we in this dispensation of grace. And then after the dispensation of grace, you've got the seven years trip. And then you've got the thousand years millennium. When Christ is on the throne in Israel. During this thousand years millennium, you must know that Satan is bound. A thousand years. It tells us this. Revelation chapter 20. So you have a lot of demonic activity during this tribulation period. The seven years trip. So when Jesus Christ comes onto the scene. There are Israelites that are vexed with devils. So Satan changes his modus operandi. How he operated in Genesis 6 with the daughters of men. And how he operates with Israel's enemies in Canaan. He changes his modus operandi. And when Jesus Christ comes onto the scene, he has people vexed with the devil. He has them essentially demon possessed. I spoke to him about the Gadarene man. He had a legion of demons. They say a legion was like a Roman army. It could be like 6,000 demons living in him. That were cast into the swine. You'll know the demons said, Send us not to the place of torment. They didn't want to go to the place of torment where Jude 6, where these angels that left their first estate were in everlasting chains, waiting to the judgment. They didn't want to go there. They said, do not send us to Tartarus. Do not send us to the place of torment. So they went to the pigs. What happens with the pigs? The pigs was an unclean animal. It gets filled with these unclean spirits, these unclean, these fallen angels, these demonic spirits. So you have the unclean animal with the unclean spirits and they go off the cliff into the lake and drown. And the lake is a picture of the lake of fire. Because ultimately the lake of fire is prepared for the devil and his angels. So after Satan is bound here, a thousand years in the bottom of this pit, he's let out for a short time and then he is cast into the lake of fire where the Antichrist and the false prophet are also. Satan speaks about his five I wills. I mentioned one of you, then to you, when it was, I will make my throne above the stars of God. He's coveting where we go in, but he's going to come down. So his five I wills from Isaiah chapter 14, from verse 12 and 14, he actually goes down five times. And I've mentioned this in a past Bible study before. He starts off in the third heaven, and then he goes to the second heaven, which is Ephesians chapter 2, 2. He's the prince of the power of the air. Prince of the power of the air. There's only two titles that are mentioned about the devil in the New Testament. The one is from Ephesians 2, 2, the prince of the power of the air. The other one is 2, Chronic, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. And that speaks about him being the God of this world. When he took over dominion from Adam in the Garden of Eden after Genesis 3, he becomes the God of this world. But he was triumphed over at the cross. But nevertheless, he's going to be cast out. And he's going to be cast to earth, which is the first heaven in Revelation chapter 12, 9. He's then going to be cast into the bottomless pit. And then he's ultimate. I mean, after the bottomless pit, he's let out for a short time. And then he's cast into the lake of fire. So he descends five times. Third heaven, second heaven, first heaven. Bottomless pit, lake of fire. First heaven is the earth. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's the third heaven. If you pick up the story of Job, there was a day where the angels of God came before God, presenting themselves, and Satan came also. And God the Father said to him, Where have you been? And he said, He's been going to and fro over all the earth. He's a restless spirit going to and fro. So that's a, a picture of when the Last Supper, and I've mentioned this to you before, but I love telling you again. When the Last Supper, you had the 12 disciples at the Last Supper with Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ said, one of you will betray me. They all asked, is it me, Lord? None of them knew that it was him. But it was Jesus knew it was Judas Iscariot. Jesus who knew who it was. It was him that is going to dip his sup in with me. And that's when Satan entered Judas Iscariot. And likewise here, when you have the angels around the throne of God... In Job 1 and Job 2, it's repeated. 
None of the angels knew that it was Satan. They looked upon Satan and they saw an angel of light. Because the devil masquerades as an angel of light. Just as Judas Iscariot was masquerading as a prophet and as a teacher of God. But he was vexed with the devil. He was essentially demon possessed. And ultimately, during the seven years tribulation, when Satan is cast down to earth, Revelation 12, 9, it happens in midway, and he inhabits the body of the Antichrist, it tells us. And he sets himself up. He sets his, his, his throne up at, in the temple of God. So that's why here in the promised land is where the temple of God was going to be. On Orland's threshing floor in Jerusalem. The same place where Abraham presented Isaac for sacrifice. The substitute sacrifice. That same place. That holy place where God is going to put his name. According to the psalmist. That holy of holy place where he's going to put his name. Where the temple is and will be restored. Is that same place where Satan is going to set himself up. He's coming for the promised land. And he wants to come against God's people. And if you can read about that, what essentially Saul later called Paul in Acts chapter 9 did with the church of Israel, where he wreaked havoc against the church. So Satan here is going to wreak havoc against the Israelites. In fact, they're going to flee when Satan sets himself up in the body of the Antichrist. It's the, the ultimate. What you have here with the daughters and the, uh, the daughters of man being inhabited by these evil spirits, and you have here the enemies of Israelite being inhabited by these evil spirits, and you've got the demonic possessed people at the time of Jesus Christ. Ultimate, the ultimate demonic possession will be when Satan himself possesses the body of the Antichrist. And just think of the power that the Antichrist will have and the authority in his name, what he can do at that time. So he's going to wreak havoc against God's people, the remnant, the kingdom church. Remember, those that have not taken the mark of the beast are going to be enemies of the beast. No man can buy or sell, save he the mark. So that happens there at the halfway. And then they flee. And I've told you where they flee to. They flee to Amman, Edom, and Moab. But I've spoken to you on those times before. And I've given you scriptures with regards to that. Particularly from Daniel chapter 11. So you've got Satan's modus operandi. You've got the fallen angels impregnating the daughters of man. Twice. So we're going to see something happening here in tribulation. Because Satan knows that his time is short. We don't see in the satanic kingdom. We don't see any of the angels coming against Satan's authority. They all seem to toe the line. They're all minions. And they do what they've been told to do. In their command. Remember this. Different powers at play. The Bible reminds us in Ephesians 6.12. When it speaks about the armor of God. And what you've got to understand. The book of Ephesians kicks off in Ephesians 1. And tells you about your wealth in God. Your spiritual blessings. There's seven spiritual blessings. Your spiritual wealth. In Ephesians 4, it speaks about your spiritual walk. The seven ones that are mentioned there. And then later in Ephesians 6, it speaks about your spiritual warfare. The seven pieces of armor. So you've got your spiritual wealth, your spiritual walk, and your spiritual warfare. And it goes on in Ephesians 6.12 and it says, For we war not flesh against blood, but against principalities. Against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So you note the authority, the triangle, the pyramid structure of the satanic kingdom. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 4, it tells us that we walk after the flesh, but we war not after the flesh. For our weapons of God are not carnal, but mighty through God in pulling down strongholds and casting down imaginations and every high thing which exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring in, into captivity every thought unto the obedience of Christ. So we are armed in the spirit. We have a spiritual wealth, a spiritual war. Satan wants to deprive us of our spiritual wealth. He doesn't want to know. He wants, doesn't want us to know about our spiritual wealth, our spiritual inheritance, and our spiritual redemption, all the things we enjoy. If you look at the seven ones, and I've done a Bible study on the book of Ephesians before, a series on that, the seven ones. From Ephesians 1, our wealth. He doesn't want us to walk. He wants us to walk in darkness. Book of Romans 13 says to us, verse 12, it says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Wherefore put off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light, that spiritual armor of light. Ephesians 4, 22 reminds us to put off the works of darkness Ephesians 4, 24 reminds us to put on the works of light. So we've got to put off, we've got to put on. We've got to know what we put off, we've got to be mature in Christ. This new man in Christ, not the old man that was died on the cross, but the new man. He, know, he needs to know what he needs to put off, and he needs to know what he needs to put on. Because we're at a spiritual warfare with Satan and his minions. But we have the power of God. Remember, he triumphed over them, making a show of them openly they were defeated at the cross what satan what adam lost in the garden of eden jesus christ restored satan is a defeated foe his time is short but do not fear god did not give us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind so we need to pick up our spiritual armor and go into a spiritual battle as Psalm 149, 6 says, Oh, with the high praise of God in your mouth and a two-edged sword in your hand. Hebrews 4, 12 tells us about the sword of the Spirit. For it's sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even unto the divine and sunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and it is certain of thoughts and intents of the heart. We have the word of the Lord. Psalm 119, verse 105 says, The word of the Lord is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We go forth as children of light. With his word, with the heart praise of God in our mouth and a two-edged sword in our hand. The battle of Jericho, the battle is the Lord's. He destroys it. We are just obedient to his word. For we fight not flesh against blood, but against principalities. There are principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. Colossians 1.16 reminds us that all things were created by him. Things in heaven and things on earth. Visible and invisible. Thrones, dominions, principalities and powers. All things were created by him and all things were created for him. They are currently satanic thrones, dominions, principalities and powers which will be cast out of heaven in Revelation chapter 12, 9 and we, the body of Christ, are going to inhabit those places. So that's why Satan is at war with you. Because you're going to take what he covets. Isaiah 14, 13. He's going to says he's going to make his throne above the stars of God. We go in there. We're going to be co heirs with Christ. We're going to be in those heavenly places. We're going to be seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is above the angels. We're reminded in Hebrews chapter 2, 16, it says that verily he took not the nature of angels, but he took the seed of Abraham. The Jehovah Witnesses believe that he's just another angel. They say Jesus Christ and Michael are the same thing. Michael means one who is like God. They use an archangel, but they say he's the same person. But he's not. He's not, in, he's not an angel. When he came, he came as a man in the seed of Abraham. And he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we are part of His body. We are going to go and occupy the heavens. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. 
We're not going to be on the earth during the tribulation. We're going to be in the heavens. After he's Satan is dethroned and cast down to heaven, we occupy the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Let your conversation be in the heavens. Philippians 3.20 reminds us. So that's where we're going. But we're living at this time of grace now. So what's Satan's modus operandi? Well, he's going to have people demon-possessed during this period of time. John the Baptist's disciples came to Jesus Christ and said, Are you the one or should we expect another? And one of the signs that he said to the Jews, a sign to the Jews, 1 Corinthians 1 22, the signs are for Israel. They demand a sign. They require a sign. One of the signs was he quoted Isaiah 61 verse 1 and he said, I'm going to set the captives free. Those that are inhabited, those that are possessed by these satanic angelic forces, I'm going to set the captives free. Remember, during the period of the millennium, Satan is bound. So Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Israel, are a kingdom of priests, and they have power, according to Mark 16, over the scorpions, over the serpents. Satan is the serpent, that old serpent, and his serpents are the devils. They can have power over the devils. James 2.19, quoted it earlier, Thou believest, thou doest well, even the devils believe and tremble. The devils are going to be trembling at this period of time, because their leader is bound for a thousand years. The tables have been turned. Here you've got this period of darkness where Satan and his forces are running amok. But when Christ comes at the end of the seven years, it tells us in 2 Timothy, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I beg your pardon, where the brightness of his coming. And with the sword, the mouth of the sword, he overcomes Satan, and Satan gets bound. And his minions scatter. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter, the Bible tells us. But with Satan, when he's bound, his minions scatter. And the kingdom of priests, Israel, Israel who are the bride of Christ, not the body of Christ, the body of God in heaven, Israel is the bride of Christ. What is being prepared for Israel is the heavenly Jerusalem where the bride shall be. It will come down like a bride from heaven. And they had power over the serpents. Power over the scorpions. So, the Bible tells us in closing from Psalm 66 12 it says through the fire and through the water I will bring you to a wealthy place Psalm 66 it's speaking to Israel he said you guys are going to go through the fire you're going to go through the water but I'm going to bring you to a wealthy place now John the Baptist said in Matthew 3 11 he said I baptize you with water but another who is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear, He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The fire. You're going to go through the fire. The fire is the tribulation. They're going to go through the fire. Like a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're going to go through the fire. But they're going to come out on the other side because the Son of Man is going to be with them through the fire. And through the water is the baptism. They cannot get into the millennium unless they've been baptized. They need to be baptized for the remission of their sins. Baptism is instrumental to Israel because it's how their sins are washed away is by baptism. Baptism is not under the program for the body of Christ. Baptism is for Israel's program. They need to be washed, be made holy for the remission of their sins so that they may receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. John said, I baptize you with water, but another shall come. He will baptize you with fire. 
And He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And I mentioned before that Jesus Christ couldn't baptize with the Holy Ghost. I think that's John 6, 39. He couldn't baptize with the Holy Ghost until He had been glorified, until He had been sent up to heaven and glorified by the Father. And then He could baptize Him with the Holy Ghost. Baptize Israel with the Holy Ghost. We, the body of Christ, are baptized according to 1 Corinthians 12, 13. We are baptized by the Spirit into the body. But Israel needs to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And once they've been baptized with the Holy Ghost, they go into this millennium and they have power over Satan and his minions. So the modus operandi of Satan is exposed. We can see it clearly in time past. And we're going to know what's going to happen in time future. We, the body of Christ, our weapons are not carnal, but mighty through God in putting down strongholds and casting down imaginations and every high thing which exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought and due to the obedience of Christ. We don't have a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So I pray that this was a blessing to you and that you can see what the enemy is up to and you can understand the days in which you live and you can be so blessed out of your socks because you live at a time of the dispensation of grace. We in this dispensation of grace. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all Above all wisdom and all the ways of man You were here before the world began Above all kingdoms, above all thrones Above all wonders the world has ever known Of all wealth and treasures of the earth There's no way to measure what you're worth Crucified, laid behind the stars You lived to die, rejected Stop.